Welcome to Noir Alley. I'm your host, Eddie Muller. Let me start off by saying that no actor from Hollywood's classic era was more ahead of his time than Robert Mitchum. He's the star of today's feature, Where Danger Lives, made at RKO in 1950. Mitchum was instinctive and intelligent, with a totally original style and attitude. Despite an early Oscar nomination as Best Supporting Actor in the story of G.I. Joe, few critics took Mitchum seriously. He had nothing in common with the stagey performance styles of the 1930s or the soul-searching method school that was becoming the rage as Mitchum became a star. Now, that stardom came while Mitchum was under contract to RKO, so it's no surprise that between 1946 and 1953, he compiled quite a resume of noir films, a genre where his screen persona was a perfect fit. He played guys who were laconic and sardonic and chronically in peril, always running afoul of murderous mobsters and vengeful vixens. For all his easygoing virility, Mitchum's stock in trade in films like The Locket, Out of the Past, His Kind of Woman, and Angel Face was playing the sap, a guy typically trapped by a series of bad decisions, usually involving women. There was, not coincidentally, a corollary between Mitchum's movie roles and his situation at RKO. After he was arrested for possession of marijuana in 1948, he feared his career was over. But new RKO boss Howard Hughes stood by the actor, and Mitchum was beholden to the eccentric tycoon. Even though he felt trapped in his long-term contract, he told people he was a tall dog on a short leash. They give me just enough rope to climb the fence, but if I try to jump, I'll just dangle. Hughes loved casting Mitchum in roles where his beefcake was routinely tenderized by wicked women, which essentially is the entire plot of Where Danger Lives. This is a lovers on the lamb story in which one of the lovers is certifiably crazy. That'd be Faith Demurg as the mystery woman. With her, the mystery has always been how to pronounce her name, which I long thought was Domergue, only to learn that in the Creole culture she comes from, it's Demurg. She insisted, however, it be pronounced Demure. One thing is for sure, she could top any story Mitchum had about being trapped in a contract with Howard Hughes. Demurg had been a Hughes protege since 1940, when she was still a teenager. Yet Where Danger Lives, released in November of 1950, was her first major role to make it to the screen. More on Miss Demurg's travails and triumphs after the movie. The script is by the redoubtable Charles Bennett from a story by Leo Rawston. Bennett scripted several of Alfred Hitchcock's best early films, including The Man Who Knew Too Much, The 39 Steps, and Sabotage, while Rawston had a hand in top-notch noirs such as The Dark Corner and Lured. There's nothing terribly original here, but Bennett and Rawston imbue the story with humorous eccentricity and unnerving obsessiveness. Always a good combination if you can pull it off. Veteran Paramount director John Farrow freelanced this one for RKO, and he had the good fortune of working with the studio's best DP, Nicholas Musaraka. Together they craft a sexy and sinister spell, aided greatly by the two stars. Adding to the film's pedigree is a terrific turn by Hollywood's MVSP, most valuable supporting player, Claude Rains, a man whose mere presence earns every movie he's in an additional star in its rating. Also on hand is Maureen O'Sullivan, Mrs. John Farrow, in outfits considerably more demure than what she wore as Jane in the Tarzan movies that made her famous. Now, if you haven't seen this one before, you are about to find out where danger lives. I absolutely love the ending of this film. The direction, camera work, editing, score, and especially the performances, create one of the quintessential noir climaxes. It may not be one of the most original films in the genre, but it's perfectly done and totally satisfying. John Farrow was one of the essential directors of noir during this era, even though he's often overlooked in favor of directors granted the auteur title by cinema scholars. 
I sometimes think that what separates an excellent director from an auteur is that when an auteur makes a lousy movie, it can still be interesting, at least to cinephiles. When a director like John Farrow makes a clunker, and he had his share, it just clunks. Fortunately, Farrow was at his best making dark dramas spiced with unpredictable humor, as he did with films like The Big Clock, Night Has a Thousand Eyes, and Alias Nick Beale. Farrow also valued a good script, which is why he worked so often with Jonathan Latimer, who wrote those three noirs as well as six other pictures with Farrow. Now, it's interesting to know that Mitchum's girlfriend, played by the director's wife, Maureen O'Sullivan, was named Julie Dorn. Dorn was Faith Demurg's stage name after she signed a contract with Warner Brothers in 1941. She changed it back to her original name after Howard Hughes bought her contract from Jack Warner. Now, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Faith Demurg had been ushered into Howard's harem while still a teenager, 15 years old to be exact. People today talk about grooming like it's a new phenomenon. Hughes spent most of his adult life grooming young women for stardom. Demurg was supposed to be the sultry sex bomb successor to his most famous protege, Jane Russell. But all she did was languish in Hughes's plush and peculiar form of captivity. Even though Demurg married band-leading philanderer Teddy Stouffer, Hughes still acted like he owned her. He spent four years fashioning the film Vendetta as a star-making vehicle for Demurg, but in the middle of the endless production, she dumped Stauffer and fled to Buenos Aires with Argentine director Hugo Freganese, whom she later married and had two children with. That finally doused Howard Hughes's interest. Vendetta, which burned through four different directors, Max Ophels, Preston Sturgis, Stuart Heisler, and Mel Farrar, was finally released a month after Where Danger Lives to tepid reviews and meager box office. But Demurg enjoyed a revival a few years later, becoming one of the original Scream Queens in a trio of 1950s sci-fi horror cult classics, This Island Earth, It Came From Beneath the Sea, and The Cult of the Cobra. Her career lasted in the 1970s and included an autobiography titled My Life with Howard Hughes. I hope you enjoyed Where Danger Lives. If you want to see film noir on the big screen, just like folks saw it back in 1950, you've still got a week left to check out my Noir City Film Festival, now playing at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. Presented in collaboration with the American Cinematheque, this marks my 25th year hosting noir at this venerable movie palace. We're celebrating with an eclectic lineup featuring an assortment of international noirs alongside some glorious greatest hits, like next weekend's screening of the original Nightmare Alley in a 35mm nitrate print. Hope I see you there. Next week, I'll be back here at Bar 355 with one of the best noirs of the 1950s, Pushover from 1954. Marks the return of Fred McMurray to film noir, as well as the big screen debut of one of Hollywood's biggest stars, Kim Novak. Until then, see you in the shadows. Next on TCM, the last time I saw Paris, then Sunday in New York, and later, High Society. It's Black Tie on TCM Today.